Open your Bibles, if you will, to the first chapter of the book of Hebrews. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 1. My, I'm still in Hebrews 11. It's a good, Hebrews 11 is a really good chapter. <laughs> yeah, we, we can spend some time there. The Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 says this, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, and that's real fancy for at various times in different manners, hallelujah, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, and hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So God has spoken to us in different ways over the, over the time. God has spoken to us in different ways throughout history. God has spoken to us in different ways um, and through different means over time. In the last days now, he's brought the Son. And he speaks to us through the Son. Amen? Glory to God. Now, one of the ways God has spoken to us or spoken to humanity is through various covenants he's made. Now, Jesus is the fulfillment of all things and, in, in, and brought in a new and a better covenant into the earth. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. But let's look at uh, you know, the different covenants. So we'll start first of all in Genesis 3.15. The first of all covenants God made after the fall of man is what is referred to as the Adamic or, or, or Adamic, depending on how you pronounce things, um, covenant made with Adam. And um, you know Adam committed high treason, sold out humanity to the devil, brought us under Satan's authority, it was not, man was not created that way. It was not God's intention that man lived that way. God was not God's intention that man be in harmony with Satan. Um, we, we say this sometimes, that Adam was the first man to be born again. He was born from life unto death. When he committed high treason in the garden, he committed, he committed high treason. His spirit was born of Satan. He became Satan's child in the sense that his spirit was now alienated from God. Well, I don't believe that. we're all God's children. Well, I asked Jesus what he said in John 8, 44. Because Jesus looked at the Pharisees and said, You are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will fulfill. Now, it, I don't have a better authority than Jesus. You might have a Ph.D., but Jesus wrote the book. Amen. Are you all here? You're going home. He is the head of the church. And if he said you are of your father, the devil, then the devil was your daddy. Amen. Spiritually speaking, that's why man must be born again and be reconciled to the Father of spirits through the new birth. Hallelujah. And so forth. And so, you know, God came in at the fall of Adam, where Adam sold out the whole human race. We were all born under sin. We were born under the penalty of sin because of Adam's transgression. But Jesus came to redeem us. Can anybody say glory to God? Hallelujah. Now, people mock that. They say, you know, you know, that a loving God sends me to hell. No, a loving God, because of Adam's transgression, made a provision to get you out of the mess Adam got you into. Adam created the mess by disobeying God and selling out mankind. God looked at it. There was only one way out. One way out. And I'm going to get over here and stuff I don't need to get into this morning, but I'm going to get into it. Adam, the head of the whole human race, had in his loins of the whole human race and when he sold mankind out to say when he committed high treason he sold the whole human race into captivity and bondage he was the head of the human race therefore there, it required a sacrifice as e equal to man to redeem man but there was none because the whole human race was sold into captivity the only way to be brought out of it the only way to redeem it the only way to to remedy it was to for God to become a man himself and sacrifice himself because he was not born in sin. He was not born under sin. He was not born under the auspices of sin. He was born outside that realm, glory to God. But he was born in the earth as a flesh and blood human being, though he were God. His spirit was sinless, therefore when his sacrifice was made, it was able to redeem mankind. Now, that is a real, 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 real short summary of why Jesus had to come. Extremely short. The bottom line is, there was no one who could pay the price for man's sin. God had to provide himself the sacrifice. The only way he could do that was to take on flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. Amen? Glory to God. Now, Mary wasn't born sinless. I know they teach that. You know, she's the immaculate conception. No, she's not. She's born flesh. Because, see, if Mary was immaculate conception, then her parents had to be immaculate conception. And if they were immaculate conception, then their parents had to be immaculate. So if you follow that logic all the way back, you had to go all the way back to a line. There was no sin in any line. That wasn't true. No, the Spirit came from God. 
God himself took on flesh. Amen. Mary was not born sinless. She had to be born again just like everybody else. I know that's, that's a teaching starting about the late 1800s in, in, in part of the church. And it was, it's just inaccurate. And if you follow that logically, there's no way to go, but all the way back to the very beginning, and you have a line of sinless people. Because if Mary had to be sinless in order to bear Jesus, then her parents had to be sinless to bear her. And then their parents had to be... See, can you see how that just keeps going back, 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 back? You can't follow that. <coughs> it sounds cool, but it's wrong. No, nope. God found a virgin who had kept herself pure, and then he used her as the vehicle by which... The, the word became flesh in her womb and was born. He took, he took on flesh. Amen? And then he became the sacrifice. Had to have a sacrifice outside the lineage of Adam in order to redeem mankind. But it had to be born a, a flesh in the earth. So God had, you know, just, I, I have a former, somebody who used to be a real close friend. They write on their blogs and mock the blood of Jesus. Daddy was so mad he had to kill his own son. No. Daddy loved us so much that he, he, his son took on flesh. See, it's one thing. It's one thing when you willingly do something. And the son willingly came. In the garden, he said, if there's any other way, let this cup pass me, but not my will, your will be done. He became obedient. The Bible says he came, became obedient even to the death of the cross. He, he, he did that willingly in submission to the plan of God so that man could be redeemed because he loved mankind, because he wanted mankind to, to come into the kingdom. He wanted mankind to be liberated. He wanted mankind to be free. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. So he spoke. <laughs> oh, yeah. So Adam sold out, and God had to make a cut. Listen, as soon as man sold out, there had to be a way to get, get the plan. Now, remember John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. Um, which taketh away the sin of the world. All, Jesus also referred to as the, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God put a plan in motion to get Jesus here. To redeem his creation. Now I'm going to be honest with you. God could have just wiped the whole thing out. Adam could have done that. God said, Bzzik. He could have wiped out the whole planet. I mean, God could have. That wasn't, that's not what he wanted to do. He wanted to redeem mankind. Amen. Glory to God. Can y'all say amen? amen? Hallelujah. All right, I, I put this stupid password on my iPad. Now it locks. Anyway. Genesis 3.15. After Adam sinned, God came down and says here in um, verse 15, And I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head. Thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And, um, and Adam said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of my wife, and thou hast eaten of the tree which, of which I can command thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread thou shalt, till, till Thou return unto the ground, for out of it thou wast taken, and for the dust thou art, and dust thou shalt return. And Adam called his wife named Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Here we go, verse 21. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Innocent animals had to be slain to cover. Now listen, it was covered. First, first covenant covered their skin, did not wash it. Amen. See, Jesus' blood, you know, though our sins be red as crimson, they be made white as, white as snow or wool. Jesus shed his blood to redeem us. Not atonement. Atonement is an Old Testament theological term in reference to covering. Hallelujah. Jesus did not cover our sin. He redeemed us from sin. Amen. So Adam, Adam had a covenant with God and where God covered them with the skins of animals because, listen, the Bible says when they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they, they, they knew they were naked. Why? Because the light went out. They were, you know, remember Moses came out of the Mount of Transfiguration? Not Mount of Transfiguration, but came out of the Mount, his face glowed so bright they had to cover it? That was just his flesh absorbing the glory, being in the presence of God and radiating back out. 
of a, understand this, spiritually dead human being. Now, spiritually, you know, we, we, we cover this, but just for the sake of this, somebody's maybe tuning in on the Internet for the first time or visiting and never heard this. Death in the Bible doesn't mean you cease to exist. It, it, it's a term that really refers to separation. Spiritual death is the separation of the human spirit from the father of life, lights or the father of life, God himself, God is life. And when you are separated from him, you are spiritually dead. Now, that doesn't mean you don't exist. It means you're separated from the life of God. Physical death is a separation of the human spirit from the physical body. You do not cease to exist when you die physically. Your body, for whatever reason, can no longer function, and you have to give up your earth suit. But you still exist. Amen. Amen. And listen, God has all those molecules somewhere. Because when the dead in Christ rise, they'll get their bodies back. He's going to pick them all up. They're all going to It's going to be the coolest sci-fi thing you've ever seen. There's not a sci-fi movie out there that can keep up with what God's going to do when he puts all the bodies back together and all that cool stuff. I don't care if they were cremated. I don't care if they were eaten by sharks. I don't care. They're going to come. Go, we'll get your body back. Coolness. It's just totally cool. I mean, it's like awesome, man. <clears throat> How can he do that? He's God. He knows every hair on your head and the ones you lost. Amen. The very hairs on your head are numbered. Have you tried counting them before? Some, for some of us, it's easier than others. Hallelujah. I mean, when you've got a head full of it, it's just easier. I mean, harder, but when you got, you know, you're, you're, you're lacking, you've got less, it's easier, but still, you, even that's hard. Amen. God knows them all. Hallelujah. He knows where your molecules are. You've got loved ones that were cremated or eaten by a shark or, you know, whatever. Went out in outer space and floated off, whatever. God, God's got a record. God knows where it is. Amen. So God made a covenant with Adam and, and, and made a promise that he was bringing the Messiah through it. Now, the second major covenant that we have is uh, the Abrahamic covenant. This is the one that's most important to us. To the church, the, the, the outside the, the plan of covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is based on the Abrahamic covenant, the most important covenant to humanity is the Abrahamic covenant. Go with me, Will, if you will, over to the uh, starting. We'll start, first of all, in the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis. I'm just kind of getting settled in here, folks. We'll start in the verse 1 of Genesis chapter 12. Now listen, Genesis 12 through 17, right there, I mean, that's a lot of stuff happens. You know, you, you, I mean, if you want, you want a, a good, solid understanding of, of Hebrews, just read Genesis 12 through 17. And, and, and Romans, there's a lot of stuff there that you need to understand, amen? So Genesis 12, chapter 1, uh, Genesis 12, chapter, chapter, verse 1, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, make thy name great. Thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now stop, underline that, put stars around it, and say, you better watch how you treat Israel. Amen. Well, and listen, there's a lot of Christians who don't like the Jews. Baby, you better like the Jews. You better be good to the Jews. I don't like the Jews. Well, tough. You better start liking them. Because, see, <clears throat> let me explain it to you. There are two lineages of Abraham. There's a spiritual lineage and there's a natural lineage. Are you here? We're the spiritual. The church, the Christians, are the spiritual lineage. The natural lineage still has this promise. You go cursing Israel, you're going to get yourself in a heap of trouble, pal. Don't get worried that Iran might get a nuclear weapon and try to blow up Israel. You will see the greatest, you'll see great natural miracles if that happens. Because you'll see it thwarted. Now, some of you, you weren't, you weren't here, but my friend Fawaz, the Jordanian Jew bomber. Now, that's what we used to call him that because he was a Jordanian at the Ramah. And his, jo his, his lifelong dream as a Jordanian youth was to grow up, join the Jordanian Air Force, and go bomb the Jews got saved thank God 
But he knew people who fought in the war against Israel back in the 60s. He, 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 he knew them personally as a kid. And they told him about the war where they came up to, to, to attack and to destroy Israel. And so they came over the dunes. And when they came up over the dunes to come in to go in, to, to go in and to destroy Israel, they said there were millions of soldiers on the dunes. This is, this is people who don't know God, who serve, you know, Muhammad, who hate the Jews, saying there were millions of soldiers. Six days. Six days. The offense, they were outnumbered, outgunned, out everything. And in six days, they, they, they kicked their back end and took land, expanded the... See, it all went backwards because they got bigger and everybody's afraid of them now. They, they, you know why they don't go in there and try to kill them all just, just straight up? Because they, they, they remember that. They had the testimonies of the people, of the millions of soldiers that suddenly showed up out of nowhere. And I'm going to tell you something. You better pray for our president that he, support, he, better, he better back off where he's heading. And forget, forget any other politi political position you, you don't like or whatever. He needs to support Israel. Because he'll bring a curse on our nation if he doesn't. Hello? God said, listen, I will not repent or alter the thing that's gone out of my mouth, says the Lord. And God said, I will curse them that curse thee and bless them that blesseth thee. You want to be on the we love Israel side. That's, just a, that's not even a hint. That's straight up. Now, I'm not, I'm not on, I, I don't get into all this, this deep, deep stuff, but I'm just telling you, here it is, folks. Well, I just don't like the Jews. I just don't like, well, you know what? That's the devil. What have they ever done that you don't like? Make money? Why? Because he'll bless them. There is a pronounced blessing on them in the natural. And people get mad about it. Why? Because they're full of the devil. It's the devil talking to you. I wasn't planning on going over here. I hadn't even thought about it until I got over here. And got, but anyway, you better shape up or ship out. Let me put it like this. You better shape up or you might get shipped out. We love Israel. Why? Because God said he would bless them that bless them and curse them that curse them. Amen. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went him, with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Herod. And he took Lot, which he wasn't supposed to do. But, you know, listen, God doesn't use perfect people. If he did, we're all disqualified. Are you here? You're going home. Hallelujah. So he takes off. Now let's look over here in chapter 13. And um, chapter 13, you know, not, not a great, great chapter for Abram. Hallelujah. Actually, the end of chapter 12 wasn't a great chapter. Get into 13. You know, in chapter 12, he got somewhere. He told, he told his wife, says, you know, she was actually his half-sister. And he says, you tell them you're my sister, not my wife, because they might kill me to get you, because she must have been a good-looking woman. They, they were really, you know. And, and then, so the, the king's about to take her in. One of the kings somewhere is supposed to, about to take her in as his wife and has a dream. <laughs> he has a hissy fit. Why didn't you tell me she's your wife? She told me, you're, you lied to me. Well, she's my half-sister. You go, you get me in trouble. Amen. <clears throat> and then they got over and got to Sodom and Gomorrah. Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 14 of chapter 13. And uh, Lot said unto him after that Lot was set. Remember, they got so big they could not stand them. The land couldn't handle them. They were getting so blessed. See, when we walk in the blessing, it can get so big it'll get off of people around us. Now what will happen is if it gets off of them because it got off of them because they were around us and they move away from us. It'll, it'll cause them trouble, which it did for Lot. He moved close to Sodom and then moved into the city. And next thing you know, he, he's, he's uh, living bad. But when, when they got separated, God said to Abram, um, lift up your eyes, look from the north, the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward. Remember that song, David Ingalls? Lift up your eyes and look. 
From the place where you now stand, north, west, south, and east, I've given you the land. I'm of the seed of Abraham. Anyway, Nathan's trying to help me out there. He said, Daddy, you need some help. For all the land which thou seest, that to, that to thee will I give it, and thy seed forever. Now, I don't care what the Palestinians say. That's God's land he gave to Israel. And since God created the earth, he can give it to whoever he wants to give it to. Well, the Palestinians need a homeland. Are you that, are you that gullible? Do you really believe that all this is about giving the Palestinians land? No, it's about destroying Israel. The, the cleric from Iran just told President Obama that he, he needs to remember that Israel needs to be wiped off the planet. The Palestinian thing is not about getting them land. It is about destroying Israel. There's lots of land in Egypt. Lots of land in Jordan, lots of land in Syria, lots of land in Iraq, lots of land in Iran, lots of land in, 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 in uh, Qatar, Saudi Arabia. But they, could, they could give off the amount of land they're trying to give them in Israel. They could chop that off and never even miss it. It has nothing to do with giving them land. It has to do with the annihilation of the Jews. Why? Because they're full of the devil. We just watched the thing on the Holocaust yesterday. We were, we were sitting around, and, 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 they, and they have film. You know, the, the revisionist history, they're trying to say it didn't actually happen. They're marching them into trenches, and the Germans are sitting at their rifles. They put, make them put their hand on the other side of the trench and just shoot them and then cover them up. And they march another group in there and shoot them and cover them up and march another group in there and shoot them. And this was the Ukrainian Holocaust that, that's kind of lost. They estimate that 1.5 million Jews were killed in the U Ukrainian Holocaust. Why? Because they were Jews. No other reason. How can you hate that many people that bad unless it's the devil? The hatred of the Jews is demonic. They just hate them. Well... But they have a covenant with God. So you're going to tell you something. You don't want to keep messing with them. I'll make thy seed as the dust of the earth, and so that the man can number the dust of the earth, shall multi, uh, so shall thy seed also be numbered. Hallelujah. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it to you. Hallelujah. So God, chapter 13. Then he gets over in chapter 14. And um, let me see if we forget the right chapter here. Hallelujah. Yeah. We get to chapter 15. And um, actually 14 is where, is where Abraham um, um, ties to Melchizedek. Okay. That's what it was. I knew it was something in 14 I wanted to get to. Um, verse, verse 17 says, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after the return of the slaughter of the, yeah, that name, and the kings that were with him in the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and he blessed be the Most High God, which had delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes. Abraham gave him tithes. Tithing was before the law. The law happened 400 years later. Abraham was a tither under promise. Jesus, are you here? Jesus, I'm not teaching on tithing today, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to throw it in here. It's just good. Jesus is a the book of Hebrews says this. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Melchizedek is a type of the, the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek. This is, an, this is allegorical. I understand that. But we are the seed of Abraham. What are we to do? We do what Abraham did. We pay tithes to Jesus, not to Melchizedek, because Melchizedek was a type of the, of, of the coming Lord Jesus Christ in that sense. Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek. We pay tithe to Jesus. The New Testament says he's a priest forever after that order. The Bible says in the New Testament we're the seed of Abraham. 
we follow Abraham's example. Amen. It bugs me. Let's be honest. I know I'm going to get back to where I was going. It bugs me the number of Christians who try to not tithe to God and justify not tithing to God. You old stingy rascal. You got a stingy devil hanging around you. I don't believe in tithing. You got a stingy devil. Is that all you got to say? No, you got a stingy, stingy devil. There's a stingy that. Why would you not want to bring the tenth, the first fruit of your increase, the tenth of your increase, to Almighty God, who redeemed you out of destruction, who redeemed you out of misery, who set your feet out of the miry clay? Glory to God, who delivered you from oppression. Why would you not want to bless Him and His kingdom in accordance with His word and His law? I just don't believe it. See, now some folks don't do it because they don't know about it. Well, you know about it now. Don't let those stingy devils get a hold of you. Amen. Well, I just made $100 this week. Let me tell you something. You live better on 90 than you will on 100 when you tithe. Why? Because the 90 is blessed. Blessed 90 goes further than unblessed 100. Bottom line. I'm just telling you. It's just the way it works. Don't everybody get excited at one time. Stand up, Julie. Wave at everybody. Julie came to us 15 years ago or so and said, I can't afford to tithe. I told her, you can't afford not to tithe. And I know, you know most people call me old greedy, money-grubbing dog pastor. But see, I had to tell her the truth. I couldn't lie to her. Amen. So she made a decision to start tithing. What happened, Julie? What was that? Now, do you think that living on 90, getting doubled, is better than living on 100 the way it was? Yeah. <laughs> you got promotions, better jobs, everything kept going up. And got Larry. That's part of the blessing. Yeah. Janet's been tithing a long time. long time. A lot of seed in the ground. But look at the harvest. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Got Jaheem in the house. Yeah. Yeah. Glory to God. Well, let me get off this. Now listen. When Abraham got back to Sodom, Sod the king of Sodom wanted to do something for him. He says this. Listen to what he says. See, I, I, folks, you've got to begin to trust God and know God. I know I'm going to get to some places, but we're just going to work our way there. I'm not going to skip over stuff on the way. All right, we're going to turn over a couple of rocks and look under them. All right? And so and he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. Woo! And Abraham, Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread, even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should say, I made Abraham rich. Now let me tell you, there's, a, there's, a, there's teachings that go around. And see, we, we have got to become spiritual people again. There's teachings that go around. Man, if the money's there, you, you, you take it. Praise God. That's a blessing of the Lord. Here, Sodom was going to give him all the spoil. And Abraham said no. Mm -hmm. Because you'll go out and say that you, that you made me rich. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not going to have it. I had a number of years ago, we had these guys come to church. They were, they were part of a multi-level marketing group. They were, you know, they were, they were infiltrating our church. Now, I'm not going to call the name of the company. But, we, but, you know, when you can have 600 on Sunday morning and 80 on Sunday night and 30 on Wednesday night because they're all out distributing and drawing circles. Yeah. And, they, and once a month they're all gone to their family meeting. What are you getting done for God? 
Now, I had one of them come in and said, well, the, the pastor said that, you know, where are you from? They said, we said Greensboro. I said, well, there's, there's a guy over there in Greensboro, a good pastor. You guys ought to go over there. He came in and wanted to take me out to lunch. Took me out to lunch. He said, we're going, and, he, and during lunch, he's sitting there, he goes, we're going to do for your church what we did for Pastor So-and-So's church. What had they done? They had taken credit for the church growing and having money. Now this, I know this has cost us money in times past. But I'm like Abraham. I said, wait a second. I said, let's just let me make it real clear to you. I know you can't imagine me. I'm such a loving, caring, tender individual. I am tenderhearted. I'll cry over you. I'll cry over, you know, things going on in your lives. We, 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 we cry with joy when good things happen. We cry when we see the bad, you know, the difficult things that happen in your families. You know, I'm a crier. I cry at cheesy chick flicks, okay? I'm not a harsh individual, but I won't put up with junk. And I leaned over the table to him. He said, he's paying for lunch. I don't care. I'll pay for my own. And so let me put it to you this way. The first time I catch you with one of my church members in a corner, and you tell them that because they're not self-employed, because they're working for somebody else, they're in a rut, and a rut is just a grave with both ends kicked out, I'm going to pick you up by the seat of the pants and throw you out the front door. Do you understand? Well, you yeah, start this out like a motorboat. Ba, 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 ba. No, no, you understand. God didn't call everybody to be self-employed. And you're not self-employed when you work for these companies. You've got to buy so much of the product to keep yourself in business. Right. <laughs> you're keeping yourself in business under the, the illusion you're going to get rich one day. No, you're keeping the guy at the top rich. Yeah, right. And so, I, I, and, and, then, and then, you know, um, a couple, a few more came in and they were, they were going, they were playing one of some music by some group. And, it was, and they were singing about their company as wor in a worship service at their family event. Oh, well, they're Christians. When we go and we worship God, we worship God. We don't worship our company. We worship the Lord. Yeah. Anyway, a couple of sermons later, they were all gone. I won't try to run anybody off, but I'm not going to put up with that junk. Yeah, right. We need more pastors who, who care more about preaching the truth and love and putting what the truth is out there and protecting the flock than selling out because they're going to get a lot of folks and a lot of money. The love of money is the root of all evil. Don't have to have a lot of it to be, have, have the love of money. You can have love of money. Not, actually, crooks love money and they don't have it. That's why they go steal it. Amen. But I was as serious as I could be. I'll pick you up and throw you out. Do you understand? Are we clear here? It was clear. No, no, no misunderstanding. You're welcome to come here. You're welcome to, to be, come to the church. But just you understand. You're not, you're not getting me into the company. I am not going to be a part of the company. Listen, if you ever get into a multi-level market, if you get into something that's going to make you a lot of money, don't bother coming to me and asking me to be in it. Pastor to help you, a, oh, pastor to bless you, don't bother. Don't even, just don't bother. I'm your pastor. And I can't have one single member of this church wondering when I come, am I coming as pastor or am I coming as the upline guy? I'm your pastor. My job is not to come up with a gimmick to get you rich. My job is to teach you what the Word says, to teach you how to live according to the Word, and let you work the Word and the Word work for you. Amen. Amen. That's my responsibility. So just in case you next, because listen, they want the pastors. These guys want the pastors of churches. Because if they get the pastor, guess what? They get the church. Same organization, my pastor home, we had a church about four or five hundred at the time. Guy was coming down every week, the head guy, the head guy up the line in Raleigh. Went to, went to my hometown high school, major sports star. Was coming down taking my pastor out to lunch every week. I said, I said, pastor, 
I said, he's just trying to get you in. Oh, no, no, he, he you know. And, and, and this, I love my pastor. Now, you know, the church we came out, great man. But, you know, he was, in this particular case, he just didn't see it. I said, he just wants to get you. He's just trying to get the church. No, 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 no. Well, after about six months of this, finally the guy kind of pinned him down. He said, look, I'm, I'm just not going to do it. Never called him again. Never called him again. Why? Because there was only one reason. You get the head, you get the body. Yeah. Side journey. Put the rock back down. Abraham said, I'll not have it said you made Abraham rich. Let's be spiritual people. Let's discern things and understand intents of what people are trying to do. When those men came to Dad Hagen, <coughs> pick the rock back up. Hallelujah. When, when Dad, those men came to Dad Hagen and said, we're, we're going to turn your books, your, your tapes into books, and you make a lot of money. He wouldn't do it for three years because he had to make sure his motive was to, to bless people and not get rich off of it. It is not the church's responsibility to make ministers multimillionaires. Under the guise, you're going to get rich doing it. That went over big. You know whose responsibility it is to bless the, the ministers? Now, aren't you, look, <clears throat> there's the scriptures that say that the laborer is worthy of his hire, especially and those worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and deed. Don't muzzle the ox and the tread out of the court. I get all that. We are, we are, but that doesn't mean we, go, we put tens of thousands of dollars in their pockets just to make them rich so that we, under the guise that we're going to get rich because we did. That's manipulation of the worst kind. I believe God's men and women should be taken care of. Ministers should be taken care of. They live by faith too. Amen. If God puts it on your heart to do something, do what God put on your heart. But don't fall for a ploy that because Bonnie gets up and puts money in my pocket that Greg's got to do it. Because he's not spiritual if he doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. Amen. And that Gwen's got to come up and put money in there. And then Ray's got to come up here and put money in there. And then what happens, all of a sudden the whole church is doing it because they're all trying to copy each other because nobody wants to be unspiritual. Right. You know what your reward was for that service? You didn't look unspiritual. If you give and those kind of things because you don't, you don't want to look like you're not spiritual, then your reward is getting relieved of the idea that you might not be spiritual. Because that's what you were doing it for. So you got your reward. Forget the money coming back. I'm looking for the amen crowd. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Well, now we're all excited about that. So Abraham said, I will not have it said you made Abraham rich. He says, now look, I am going to take enough with the young men of Eden. I'm going to let them have that. And, and let have their food portion, but, I, but that's it. Okay. Chapter 15, God appears to him and says, you know, and came to him and said, I fear not Abraham, thy shield, thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me? See, I go childless. And the steward in my house is Eliezer of Damascus. In other words, he just had a servant's son that was in his house, and he would be the inheritor. And verse 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, thou shalt, This shall not be your heir, but he that come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, tell the stars that thou be able to number them. He said, So shall thy seed be. And he believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, God's got to get everybody on board. <clears throat> pastors can't do it by themselves. Oh, uh, if you were a great leader, you'd have it all done. No, 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 no. Let me say, let me say something. I, I, there's a lot of teaching going around. There's all kinds of book on, on spiritual leadership. You know what? And half of it's worldly principles. Not all of it, but half of it's worldly principles. Business principles. I'm following God. Follow me. Yeah, but you need to sit this, this, this. Paul just simply said, follow me as I follow the Lord. Amen. Jesus would, you know, write the vision. We've told you what the vision is. We don't need to have all, all this world-minded stuff to get everything done. 
Let's just get full of faith. The Holy Ghost be led by the Spirit. Hello. Listen, I've, I've, been, I've been watching this stuff for years, and, I, and I've seen people have meetings in their churches for years, bringing these leadership guys in. And you know what they do? They come in and they, and they say, well, your church has got to commit to give so much money to me every month so I can teach you how to have leadership. That's the world. I said, that's the world. Are you here? God's got to get everybody on board, so he gets them on board in the Spirit. See a need, plug into it. Now, that doesn't mean we don't do anything, but, you know, at the same time, you know, we've got to get our mindset. We can't, we can't look at, leadership is not what's going to cause a church to grow, spiritually. You can grow organ, any organization according to the world using the world's principles. But I'm not here to lead you in the world's principles. We're here to walk by faith and not by sight, be led by the Spirit, do things a spiritual way. Do them by the Holy Ghost. Do them out of the Spirit. People hearing from heaven. You're spiritual people. You're full of faith and you're full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I don't have to, ha I don't have to train you that if you see paper on the floor, it's a good idea to pick it up and throw it away. Come on, people. I am trying to teach us. We have, the church for too long has relied on the world's methods to get things done. We rely on the world's techniques to get people to come in. We rely on the world's style to get people to listen up. Doug Jones posted, our, 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 our leader for RMAI, uh, he used to live with Dad Hagen. <coughs> in a post this week out there, he just said, I am tired of everybody trying to force us to believe that young people only have a 20-minute attention span, that old people can't relate to young people, and that if you don't have a blowout service every time, you didn't have a move of God. How many colleges do you go to that the classes are 20 minutes long? It's the church telling everybody that you, you could, young people could only listen for 20 minutes. Old people can't relate to young people. Yeah, got gray hair. You can't talk to me because I got to have tats and an earring on my lip and earrings bolts in my nose and hinges and, and, and gauges and, and weights on my ears and got to look like, uh, you know, I just came out of the, the, the fair, uh, uh, the, the local, local fair freak show, and you can't relate to me. See, that's your flesh. I don't have to go get tatted up to relate to him. You see, I learned to trust the Holy Ghost. He told me to go preach the gospel. And then it's the Holy Ghost's job to convince them of sin, convict them of unrighteousness. You know, the three things, you know, I, I got them mixed up now, but anyway. The Holy Spirit's job is to deal with them. My job is to tell them what the Bible says. Right. Tell them what the Word of God says. And then I trust, not my tattoos, I trust the Holy Ghost to come and talk to them. Well, what if they don't listen? If they don't listen to the Holy Ghost, they are not going to listen to your gauge. You'll just think you're cool. Hey, it's a cool preacher. They still ain't going to listen to what you got to say. And if they even adhere to anything, it'll be out of the carnal realm and not out of the spirit realm. And the man has to believe with his heart, not his head. Amen. It's not a mental association of, of coolness. It is a spiritual, uh, a spiritual connection with the Most High God, the Father of spirits. Amen? The wisdom of this world is earthly, sensual, and devilish. The carnal mind is enmity against the things of God. It cannot be subject to the laws of God. And yet we run out and try to use all the things of the world to get them to believe in something their mind is already enmity against. Let me tell you, church, what we need to be doing. I know I'm off. We need to get full of the Holy Ghost again in the church. We need to have faith in the Holy Ghost all over us. We need to speak words anointed by the Spirit of God that are piercing words that go into the hearts of men and women, not their heads, but into their hearts. Paul stood there and argued with the king one day. The wisdom and mind of Paul and all the learning and education he had. And the king looked at him and said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian.
Persuasive words are not enough. Cool look is not enough. Showing up, me coming out with gauges and, and tatted up and, you know, looking hip and cool and in tune. When Jesus went and ate with the publicans and sinners, he ate in his, in his teacher, rabbinical clothing. Go say it. They all called call him Rabboni, teacher. And the teachers wore a certain type of clothing. Jesus didn't strip down and wear the clothing of the culture. He wore the rabbinical clothing and still ate with the publicans and sinners. It was the words of life and the anointing on him that was destroying the yokes and removing the burdens, not looking like them. <clears throat> the church has missed it. We're filling our churches with people and who are coming for cool, you know, sets of worship and coming for the light show and the smoke show. And listen, I don't, okay, whatever. But we're filling our church and we're depending on those things instead of the anointing. And they can come in and they can come walk out and say, that's the coolest church service I've ever seen in my life and not experience the anointing and not have the yokes destroyed and the burdens removed out of their life. It is not about feeling cool. It is about, is there a power? Is there an anointing in the manifest, manifest presence of God in when you're there together? And we've got to start coming as spiritual people. And get on board. I got off of this because I said, get on board. Remember, God spoke to Abraham and said, or Abraham said, I'm gonna, you're, you're gonna have, the, the seed's coming out of your own bowels. He gets over in chapter 16. Guess who's not on board? Sarah's not on board. His wife. That's pretty bad. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, bare no, she had no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abraham, Behold, listen, now this is not God. God didn't say he was doing this. She said, Now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. God didn't say he restrained her from bearing. There's no scripture that proves he had restrained her from bearing. She went by natural circumstances. She wasn't on board. God hath restrained me from going then. God gives us a vision. God gives us a plan. God gives us a word. And let me say something. In due season, that word will come to pass. In due season, we will reap if we faint not. Sarah fainted. I mean, she crashed and burned. What woman in her right mind gives her husband another woman? That's a total crash and burn. Crazy woman. Because most women in this room, if, man, if their husband came in with another woman, I mean, you know, Pastor Ed would be at the funeral home this week. Lord, we, we want to we bury our, our former deacon. And then go to the jail and pray for the wife. So she crashed and totally burned. Can you say that? Can you see that? I mean, Sarah, she goes, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing a child. Hallelujah. Uh, I pray thee, go unto my maid, that it may be I obtained children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. Now, I don't know if it actually went down this way, but we don't see one argument from Abram. He didn't say, no, baby, I can't do that. He didn't go, look, that woman is ugly. So, hey, that's probably a pretty woman. And Abram looked at her and went... <laughs> Right on, baby. There's no argument here. I mean, she said, go unto my handmaiden. Abraham said, yeah. Alternate plans, other than the plan of God, will produce Ishmael's. And they will hound your life. For centuries, for millennia, are you here? This had this wasn't a, a one night event that caused trouble for a couple of, you know for a couple of generations. We still have trouble with Abraham and Hagar going into the tent today. That went over big, and uh, he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress, that means Sarah, was despised in her eyes. She was like, kind of like, I got, the I got the bun in the oven and you don't. Look at me. 
And of course, Sarah got ticked off. Of course, now Nathan's going, women. <laughs> One minute, they're saying, take the woman and have a child with her. Then when she gets pregnant, throw her out. Like I said, she crashed and burned. She wasn't thinking spiritually. She was thinking carnally. Hello? She was throwing a pity party. That's really what she was doing. And uh, she went to Abraham and said, do something. He said, do whatever you want to do with her. And uh, she, she ran her off. Then the Lord comes, an angel comes and says, go back. Amen. Now listen to what the angel of the Lord tells. Boy, listen to this. Now, you know, anybody know who came out of Ishmael? The Arabs. Listen to this. The angel of the Lord said, and he found, he found her. She said, and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm fleeing from the, the, the uh, face of my mistress Sarah. The angel says, go back. The angel Lord said, I will multiply the exceed exceedingly, and it shall be number for multitude. Um, bear a son, you'll call his name Ishmael, that which, which means God shall hear. God heard her cry. Listen to this, but the Lord here, listen. Listen to what God said. This is not God pronouncing this on them. This is what was going to happen with him, and God declares it and tells the future, prophesies. He'll be a wild man. His hand will be against every man. And every man's hand against him, and he should dwell in the presence of his brethren. Does that describe the Arabs? They don't like anybody. They only like each other. And they don't even like each other real good. They're against everybody. Hello? And they're wild. I mean, there's, there's untameness about the cultures. God said it would be that way. Thousands of years in advance, God said it would be that way. And Abram was, and Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his name, which Hagar bare Ishmael, verse 15 and 16. Abram was four score and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. Now here we are, 11 years after the promise, and Sarah gets antsy, crashes and burns. Got off board. Folks, when God gives a word, it may not come to pass in the timetable you think. And you can't measure it again. Let's, let's take it as churches. Just because God spoke over our church and said things doesn't mean just because some other church comes in and gets big real quick that we've missed God and they got it. What God said is God said. Are you here? And dear Lord Jesus, we don't need Ishmael's. Are you here? We don't need to birth spiritual Ishmael's trying to get something to happen. See, I've seen people change relationships with ministries so they could get bigger quicker. We have a, we have a ministry. I won't call a name. I'm going to try to be as, as generic as possible. They came here. They came out of a, another state. They came in with a, with a ministry supporting them, helped set them up, put them on television, and they grew. Well, then they got to a certain size, and they changed associations of their pastor to a more local pastor over, over in another city that's a, that was a bigger church. And, and for a season, they were, he was their pastor. And they kept calling their name. So, I, well, that's my pastor. Well, then people who were living in the area who went to that other church started coming to this church because, you know, well, they're in relationship and it's closer, so they started going to their church. They got to a certain size. Then there was another major ministry that got big in the country, got on television, and now that's when they switched over there. And I had one of the people who used to go to our church that goes there tell me that they outgrew the other pastor. Is that right? They outgrew them. Hogwash. Their name wasn't big enough anymore. That's Ishmael. You're birthing an Ishmael. You're birthing something out of the flesh that's not of the promise. You're changing, you're changing pastors uh, like some people change pants every day. Why? Because they got a bigger name. You're milking the name to get more popular. We know what I got to say about that? <laughs> So if you're my size, you can say what you want to say. When you get my size, talk to me. I don't have to. I can judge things because it's not right. You're birthing Ishmael's. I'm not going to birth an Ishmael. Hello? God called me to Ramah. I'm with Ramah. That's where I am. I'm not using it for the name. Dad's gone. A lot of major ministries don't, don't really support Ramah anymore because Dad's gone. I'm still part of Ramah because God called me there. I'm not changing 
when, when pastor, pastor steps down and goes home and, and Craig takes over, I'm, I'm connected to Raymond. I'm there because God called me there, not because of whoever's at the top. I want birth in Ishmael. God called me to a mandate. God called me to a calling. He did not call me to a man. He called me to a promise. God told Dad, hey, go teach my people faith. We were called to a mandate. That's my calling. I'm not looking for somebody else that I can hook onto and, and tap into and get a bigger name. That's what I'm called to. Yeah, but if you hook up with so-and-so, you can, you can, they can promote. I, I'm not here to promote my ministry. I'm here to obey God. I'm here to do what God said to do, the way God said to do it. When God does what God wants to do, when God does what God does, God's going to do it. Some people don't know this. How many have ever heard of John Osteen? Did you know his church was under 200 people after 25 years? 25 years. God's little Baptist evangelist still had a church of under 200 people. I know that because Joe Morris, his mom and him lived in Shreveport, Louisiana, would drive six hours once a month to go be in John Osteen's services before he was ever known who, anybody knew who he was. Because it was the closest word church they could find. Now, actually, for years, it was still Southern Baptist. They, were, they, they had a tornado come by one day. John Osteen used to tell the story. He said, we kept Baptists on the side of Lakewood Baptist Church. Our tornado came by one day, blew the word Baptist off. We took it as a sign from God and left it off. It became Lakewood Church. But he, but he kept his papers. He didn't turn his papers there at the time. We're called to the calling of God. And when God says do something a certain way, you do it a certain way. Hey, this is 11 years. See, in, in our circles today, in, our, in, in, in the church today, if you go 11 years and haven't seen a result, we start looking for things to fix it. Sarah. And you get an Ishmael. Abram was 86. 11 years after God showed up and said... Get out of here. I'm going to make you the sand of the seashores and the stars of the heaven. Eleven years have come and gone. And Sarah is still childless. And so they're going to take it to their own hands. I, you, we never take anything to our own hands. We keep doing what God said do, the way God said do it. Following after the Spirit of God. Endeavoring to hear from heaven and do what God said. Hello? Yeah, but you're not getting results. Let's change something. Do it. Second pet peeve of the day. Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, is insanity. Not if it's obedience. I've heard people tell me that years ago. Ah, if you doing, keep doing the same thing over and over again and not getting any, and you're expecting a different result and nothing's changing, it's, an, it's the definition of insanity. I'm glad the children of Israel didn't have you there to help them out when they were going around the walls of Jericho. They went around seven day, six days, and on the seventh day they went seven times, and on the seventh time, we keep doing what God says do until God says do something different. We don't understand what's going on in the realm of the Spirit that God, that God hadn't showed us yet. Right. The walk of faith may look insane to people outside of the church. That's why I don't adhere to the world's methods yeah. and the world's wisdom. Because I don't want Ishmael's in the process. It's too much to clean up. Amen. Are you here? There are people who got big that aren't supposed to get big at least that quick. Well, how could it not be God if somebody's got 5,000 people when the husband and the wife are in adultery or they're in fornication or they're in homosexuality and they lose their families to the world or family that goes to hell because they had a big church when they weren't ready for it? Because they used certain principles and it worked and it wasn't God? You got five seconds to pull out your Nerf gun and shoot me. Okay. There's too much. People writing books that shouldn't wrote books. People will get popular because they weren't, and they, weren't, they weren't ready to be popular. But the world system thought they were cool. They used it and they, they advanced them. They do that in the world all the time. 
We've had presidents advance. Because, let's remember, how, how many remember our, our, our state senator? Came out of nowhere. It was an ambulance chaser. Came out of nowhere. And suddenly he's a senator and being groomed for president. Do you know why? Because he was Kennedy-esque. They thought they could groom him to be a Kennedy-type candidate. Had the look. But he had flaws in his character. That, in my opinion, prohibited him from being president of the United States. The, the parties do that all the time. They look for somebody they think they can run because they can market them, not because of their character. And that's going on in both parties. Actually, all four parties. Libertarian and the uh, Green Party, whatever that one is. The, uh, the Nader Party, whatever that one is. The world has a way of doing things that you can achieve success in the world with. How many know you can lie, cheat, and steal and get rich? But God said, I'll give you the power to get wealth and add no sorrow therewith. Let me tell you something. There's a difference between worldly wealth with the constant looking over your shoulder because you know you shat to somebody, somebody's coming to get you one day. They're looking for the opportunity. You can't make your money on bootleg liquor and underhanded dealings and then wonder why bad things happen out through your family history. And everybody sits around and calls it the, the Kennedy curse. Well, the reason it's a curse is because of what they did. God didn't curse them. They brought it on themselves. It's not a judgment. It's just you brought that, you, you opened yourself up. Yep. Got away with all kinds of stuff. Catches up with you. Now let me say something. That's the world. If we do that in the church, we open ourselves up to the same thing. Don't be surprised that pastors of mega churches have fallen into sin when they've sold out the, the anointing and the gospel to get there. That went over big. When you start, all you're doing is raising money to get rich and you're not, and you're not using that to promote the gospel. You're using that to be, be rich. Don't think it won't catch up with you. Are you here? We can't follow the wisdom of this world. We have to follow the wisdom of God. We have to follow the Spirit of God. Amen. And we cannot take counsel. I, I know I'm, I'm so far off, but do y'all mind? Psalm 1 1. Right out of the gate. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sitters, nor sitteth, sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, and bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The godly are not so. But they're like chaff, which the wind driveth away. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the ways of the righteous, but the, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. We are called to a higher calling. Sarah had to get on board before they could go anywhere. It took 13 more years that God works himself out of Sarah. Genesis 17, 1. And when Abraham was 90 and 9 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the Almighty God. 13 years later. And listen, even then, she had a, she had a temporary setback. Because when God, Abraham says, I, Oh, the Ishmaelite might live before thee, he said, Now I've heard you, but he's going to come out of Sarah. Sarah laughs. And apparently it wasn't a joyous laugh. 
It was, I am 89 stinking years old. And then the Lord, then they said, why did you laugh? I didn't laugh. Next, go on the line. Talk about the patience of God. It took him 25 years to get that woman on board. Now, we've had some things happening here in the past few weeks. But I speak to you by the Holy Ghost. God's getting people on board. The right people are coming on board so that the promise can be fulfilled, which was spoken. Remember that when it got to this point in time, God said, put the handmaiden and the son out. They will not be the heir. And I believe God's speaking here and saying, some people had to go. It wasn't God's plan for them to go. God wanted them here. But some people had to go so he could, so he could bring, the, bring us into harmony to fulfill the promise. Let me tell you something. I, we're not going to take any man ideas. We're going to take God ideas. And it's a coming so fast, it's going to knock you off your feet. Because a year later, it's, uh, Isaac shows up. When God shows up at 99, a year later, Isaac shows up. This time next year. This time next year, you ain't going to believe this place. Because it, it is the season of the full. When the fullness of time came, he brought forth the son. For us, the fullness of time is upon us. The fullness of time is upon us. Some things had, there's some things that, were, that happened that I didn't want to happen, but had to happen. There's been some places we've been through in the past couple of years that I didn't want to go through. Still ain't out, out of it completely yet. We're coming out. We're coming out. As pastors and church, we're coming out. I'm coming out. Just saw Made in Manhattan the other day on TV. I was like, okay. <laughs> We're coming out, and the blessed, the fulfillment of the promise is coming on. We'll still have, you'll still have fights after that. But the good thing is, I don't have any Ishmaels to put up with after, after we start going out there and fulfilling. They're not out there, because I wouldn't do them. I'm, listen, you can be smart and learn from others, or be dumb and do what they did. And have to learn it the way they did. I'd just as soon learn from Abraham than instead of have to do what Abraham did. Amen. Amen. The blessings of God, the call of God, the anointing of God, being led by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. I know I'm kind of off the main subject matter, but you know what? We're not off the main subject matter if the Holy Ghost leads us here and wants to speak prophetically. You know, if we're, we're, we're following what, what I have and then the Holy Ghost says, well, let's go here. We follow the Holy Ghost. No man plans. Everybody say no man plans. No man. God plans. God. Anointed plans. God. We're following after the Spirit. Wow. When you follow after the Spirit. How could all this happen in the next year? I don't know. That's not my job. Not your job. What's your job? Follow me as I follow the Lord. What's my job? Follow the Lord. It's real simple. It's not complicated, is it? Hello? <clears throat> We're going after it. I'm going to Estonia. Sooner than I thought I was. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. We're out of debt. Money's coming. Money cometh. Overflow. Why? Because we're a base of ministry. We've got things to do. So we're going to follow the spirit of faith. We're going to follow God. I'm going to follow God. You're going to follow me. We're going in together. We're going to possess the land together. The promise comes upon us. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Glory to God. We're going to get her. Look, we're just going to be like Larry the Cable Guy. Get her done. All right? We're going to get her done. He's made her in the movie Cars, okay? <clears throat> yeah. 
I think tuh made her without the tuh. Yeah. We're just going to get her done. How? Follow me as I follow the Lord. And I'll follow the Lord. You follow me. We'll get it done. We're going to walk by faith and not by sight. We're going to get God plans. We're going to walk in God plans. We're going to walk in God wisdom. We're going to know what to do when we need to do it. I might lose my company and say, Pastor, what are we going to do? I don't know what we're going to do, but God will show us we'll know what to do when it's time to do it. We'll have, we'll have the answer. God might give you the answer. It ain't all about it. Hello? God can give you witty inventions. God can give you supernatural ideas. When they went to build the temple, God gave, listen, the guy, Moses, did not know how to do all the stuff that all the people did. He just went and heard from God. He said, well, we're going to do this. And then God showed Greg how to take wood and cover it in gold or brass or whatever. He showed Gina how to sew six-inch thick curtain. Yeah. That's it. Hello? He showed this one how to make this and this one how to make that and this one how to... And, and he just started showing them how, how to do it. Moses didn't teach them how to do it. God showed them how to do it. That's the individuals. He just showed them how to do this. All of a sudden, all the way, well, I'm a weaver. How do you know? God showed me how to do it. I'm a brass guy. How do you know? I was late asleep last night. Five guys. So I'm a brass guy. How do you know? God showed me in a dream how to make this. Moses is going, cool. Right on. Go, go, go do it. Go do your thing. God showed you. You do it. <laughs> so what's that? That's supernatural. I said, that's supernatural. Do we not have a supernatural God? Do we not serve the God of heaven and earth? Do we not have a God who can show you how to get people won and people saved? Glory to God. Do we not have a God who can show you how to supernaturally get the things done that we need to get done for the kingdom? We're waiting for you to show us how to do it. Why don't you go before God and have him show you? Because if I teach you how to do it, you'll try to replicate what I believe I've got about the supernatural side. God can show you. He might show Gwen one way and show Jeff another. And both of them work. But if I tell you, know, listen, we've got a lot of places, you know, that use the Romans roadmap and the four spiritual laws. And everybody falls into that pattern. And they go out and they use those things. But that's what God showed one guy or another guy. God might show you something, might show you the Galatians roadmap. Or the Ephesians Star Trek map. Are you here? You could have been, Pastor, I'm a soul winner. How do you know? God showed me how to win the loss last time. Go. <laughs> have at it, dude. Right. Just bring them in. We'll disciple them. You go get them saved. Because uh-huh. God showed you how to do it. Amen. Are you listening? We've got to move back to being spirit led. And looking for, I want to bless my church. God showed me how to do so. You know, what is it you want me to do? And God shows you. Pastor, God showed me how to minister to this. Well, go do it. God showed you. Mm-hmm. Go do it. I'll tell you, go do it. I don't have to have it in triplicate. God showed you, go do it. Why? Because that is anointed. You've heard from heaven. You've got a revelation. The Spirit of God spoke to you. What happened with that? Faith came. Now, see, we're not opposed to going. We've done not going to the, taking it to the streets, going knocking on doors, doing that kind of thing. I'm not opposed to that. But what I'm saying is, if we get people who get supernatural revelation about how to soul win, so to speak. Yeah, you're right. We won't have to come up with techniques to uh-huh. get. They're walking out of revelation. They're walking in something that came from God to their spirit. And what happens? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. They have faith to see it through because they heard from heaven, and God spoke. Mm -hmm. The breath of God breathed on them and showed them what to do. You go out doing, we can go about doing things that we're supposed to do. You know, we're going out and knock on the doors or whatever. But when you have a dream of a man over in Macedonia says, "Come come over unto us. You follow God. I believe, we, I believe we're coming back into it. That, listen, you want, we're going to have to have supernatural churches. Because when all the junk hits the fan in our country, 
and in the world and all the stuff that's going on and all the, you know, Kim was sharing some stuff with me last week that, that people, that's not in the public. FEMA camps being set up around the country. Basically concentration camps for those who oppose the takeover under the guise of FEMA. There's stuff going on you don't know about. We have 26 terrorist training camps in America right now. Al-Qaeda training camps. They know where they are, and nothing's being done about it. Charlotte and Raleigh have one. There's stuff going on that we as the church had better know how to live by faith and how to be able to hear from the Spirit of God and to walk in the power and the authority of God so that when the enemy comes, we can do just like Jesus and walk right through the middle of them. They came to throw him off a cliff one day. I know I went like, dear Lord. Anybody still with me? Yeah. Anybody left and gone home? Nope. All right. They came one day to take Jesus and throw him off the cliff, and the Bible says he passed through the midst of them. You can't touch the anointing. We're all MC hammers. Dun, 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 dun. Can't touch. Dun, dun, dun. I got to give me some funky pants like he had. I can't, I can't deal with these pants. See, I done lost my crowd. <laughs> Get into the anointing and say, you can't touch this. See, where God's calling us to be a supernatural church, this, this play church mess <clears throat> is not going to work. Having Islamic, uh, uh, Chris-Islamic services are not going to work. They have a church that call it having a Chris-Islamic service. Put a Quran and a Bible out and invite the Muslims and the Christians to come together under the guise that we're going to reach the Muslims. You know how you reach the Muslims? Repent and be born again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Not, we honor Muhammad. I don't honor Muhammad. When Israel, was in, when Israel worshipped false gods, they tore down the altars and the groves when they came back to God and repented. They didn't honor them. That's the way to win. That's, a, that's, that's how Ishmael. <clears throat> That's a worldly way to win the world. Mm -hmm. let's, not, let's not confront people with the truth. What's the truth? If you don't get born again, you're going to hell. We don't want to talk about hell. That scares people. Good! <laughs> Nobody should want to go to hell. And if you do, you need help. There is not a stairway out of hell into heaven. Zephyr didn't get it. Are you here? The hotel, it's, it is the Hotel California. You check in, you don't check out. Both those songs were about hell. The writer, for, the writer for Led Zeppelin wrote Stairway to Heaven in Alexander Crowley's house, the satanic evangelist. Alexander Crowley is on the balcony of the Eagles uh, Hotel California. When you open up the album jacket, he's up on the balcony in the middle with a 666 on his forehead. <clears throat> Seen it with my own eyes. Had the album. Burned it with all my other world. Anyway. <laughs> Hotel California is about checking in. It's about hell. But it's about a party. Everybody thinks it's a party. It's not a party. <clears throat> we have to reach this generation with something other than being like this generation. Oh, you got to understand young people to win young people. No, I need to understand the anointing. One of the greatest testimonies of all this is Jim Wil uh, Wilkerson and, 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 and uh, Nicky Cruz. Mm -hmm. right. Nicky Cruz was a street banger, bang head banger. He was a street kid. He was a, he was a gang member. He would pull out his knife in, in, in Wilkerson's face and say, I'm going to cut you into a thousand pieces, and then what's your God going to do for you? He said every piece is going to cry, I love you, Nicky. I love you, Nicky. It wasn't, he didn't dress like a gangbanger. He wasn't dressed like a thug. He went out there with his Bible and preached to him, kept preaching to him, preaching and loving on him. And the love of God, the anointing of God broke through, not him looking like him. That's what we need. Men and women full of faith in the Holy Ghost. Not spending our time trying to be like everybody else. And I know people out there say, I disagree with you. I don't care if you disagree with me or not. There's nowhere in the Bible that says dressing like him wins them. It does say the anointing breaks the yoke. It did say go preach the gospel. 
It did say the Holy Spirit will be the one who deals with people. Amen. I said amen. amen. Paul rushed into a theater, people worshiping the goddess Diana, and preached the gospel to them. Didn't go over well with, with the people who were making the statues. It's the anointing that destroys the oak. Are we going to be anointed or not? I know this got off the Abrahamic covenant. We'll get back there. Y'all ready? You ready to pray for, for God to show you how to, to do what you need to do with the body of Christ in this church and be anointed to do it? How you can come in anointed by the Holy Ghost with a witty invention or a good idea, a witty supernatural idea. You don't have to, listen, not, a, not, a, not, a, not one you got out of a book on, on, on how to clean the church. But a supernatural idea that God says to do this. God will give you supernatural ideas for natural jobs. I'm going to close right here, I promise. This is not closing one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. This is the final episode of this morning's sermon. When we first came to Greensboro, we had a, an, an IBM 8088. Green screen. Ran print shop monochrome graphics card on to be able to do some graphics. Anybody remember those days? I wrote programs in DBase 3 Plus, a DOS-based relational database, the first PC relational database that was out there, and the best. It was, it was the most powerful, strongest one that made. Still probably the most powerful, IBM, just, I mean, not IBM, but, uh, but Windows does their stuff, and, and because they got the market, they, they promote their stuff. But DBase is the most powerful one ever written. Now it's visual DBase. It can be written in, in you know, the graphical environment. And I, I was writing the, the churches, what we call the general ledger program, and printing reports. Well, you know, we have multiple codes for giving, multiple codes for where it goes. And so, um, you know, you, if you, we got like eight different codes for giving. You know, the general, a tithe, uh, a, a tithe on offerings, a general, a, a building fund, a guest speaker, a missions, you know, the different things we had, you know, in, in those codes. And, 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 and God had been showing me, and I've just been getting ideas on how to put all this stuff together and how to, you better put, take all these things and then take, you know, cost centers, you know, where you have this went to, this went to children's ministry, this went to this. And I was sitting down one day and I was, and, and, and I was getting ready to write the print report for this, you know, Oka Data, cha you know, dot matrix printer. <laughs> Great printers. 132 carriage, 132 position, printer. <laughs> Love 132, but you can put a lot of data out there. Now you can't. I had to write and put it on, on eight and a half by eleven, but I got I, I made the fonts different sizes. But anyway, so I'm sitting down and I'm and I'm and I'm getting ready to write this program and and I start going, do if, and I'm having to write a list of if statements within a do loop for each and every type of offering or expense that went in and out based on this one two character numeric alpha of numeric code that went in and i had to do if it equals this do this put it in this position had to write that print position if it's this put it in this print position if it's that put it in this print position and it was just, I mean, and you, on 8088, we're talking. He sits there and scratches his head while he determines if it's going on to the next one or not. That's how slow it was. And I'm laying there in bed one night, and I'm thinking, Lord, there's got to be a better way. Just thinking. Lord's got, and all of a sudden, God said, and that's something I didn't know how to do. Are you here? This is something I did not know how to do. He said, use the, um, and I forgot the term for it. <clears throat> but when you put the ampersand in front of something, it, it, literal value, use the literal value uh, condition. And I went, wow! <laughs> I get up, run to the room, get out my programming pad, start writing down. All I had to do was load all the print positions in as variables. Assign them, each print position was, you know, uh, something 01. And I, what I did is I, I would take the 01 of an offering Tie it together with an A, it's an A01, print an A01, and say A plus little value of the code. Put it together, and then print in that position. It took six lines of code. 
I did away with like 60 lines of code because I was laying in bed and God spoke to me. Now, and that, now today on the process, that wouldn't matter. You could do it the other way and it would... But now it just goes... Blip. It don't even do blip. It just kind of goes... Uh, what was that? Well, here it is. <laughs> 60 lines of code was eliminated on a slow machine. Wow. They had, they did it for every, we had to do that for every record. Uh-huh. It did away with it. Because God gave me a supernatural answer to a natural problem. And I'm telling you, it works. It still works today. That code is still embedded in that print program, even though we've changed printers, we're printing on, we're printing on uh, laser printers and stuff. It's, that code is still there, and it still works. Because it was supernatural. I'm not going to mess with it. Why mess with God? And God can do the same thing in, in, in running the church in your businesses, in in anything we have our hands set to, God can give us supernatural witty ways to get it done. If we'll look to him and we'll grow the church and and flourish the church, have I really gone that long? (laughs) How many love the pastor still? Did we start at 1140? Have I filled up both sides of a 90-minute cassette, Brother Bill? It's the old days. Uh, <laughs> glory to God. I remember the day we filled up both sides of a 90-minute cassette, and we thought we had us a church service. We got into the second one. Are we into the second one yet? <laughs> Stand up. I'm going to quit. <laughs>